Um, my name is Deepali McClough. I've met some of you already, but um, I was asked to facilitate this presentation and a brief panel discussion during tonight's event. Um, as you know, today's meeting is being hosted by EDF Renewables in an effort to meet the community and to continue the conversation around solar energy that they've engaged in with you for the last couple of years. So thank you to all of you for coming out on work nights, on the weeknights, and to the EDF team for being here. You may have already attended a community meeting in the past or a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, the goal of this meeting is to introduce or reintroduce EDF to you and the community and to address common questions that you may have and that EDF has heard as they've, they've been here. So to that end, we'll cover various themes that we've heard, and EDF has invited some guests who have deep knowledge about these subject areas and these themes. They are seated to the left of me. Um, tonight, we hope to answer some questions and that you come away with more information than you had walking in. So here tonight, um, as our panelists and presenters, are Kevin Campbell with EDF. Many of you know him, and he'll be speaking in just a few moments. Um, Ken Kaliski, who is with RSG, and he'll be talking about noise. Um, Matthew Robinson with EDR, and he will be talking with us about visual resources and impact assessment. Victoria Carey, who is with DNVGL, and she is an expert on energy storage. We have Dr. Chris Olson, who is with Olson Environmental Health Management. He'll speak with us about public health and safety. And then last but not least, we have Lexi Hain, who is with Agrivoltaic Solutions, and she'll talk to us about some benefits of merging um, solar and agriculture. So um, maybe we can, sorry, we can advance a slide or two. That's me. Okay, so I've gathered a couple of questions that people have submitted. I have some friends around the room that have index cards or you may have received them when you come in. So we're hoping that as you hear this presentation, you fill out questions, raise your hand, we'll collect the cards, and then we're going to group those questions into themes. I will then moderate the discussion with the panelists after the presentation. So this should take about an hour. Um, but I just want to emphasize that we've had an open house before, we have an open house after, so the format of this portion of the meeting is to take your written, not your verbal comments, um, and if we don't address your question um, or address it to your satisfaction, our team is still here. We're here for over an hour after the presentation is over, and please talk with them directly. Um, the goal is to, again, answer, answer your questions, what we, what we can tonight, and if not, get back to you after this meeting. Um, and lastly, we just ask that you respect your neighbors and the folks that have taken time out of their schedules to be here, um, and, and just sit tight for the presentation. So can I see a show of hands of those of you who live in Mount Morris? That's, that's almost everyone. Um, what about Geneseo? Livingston County? Well, only, only living outside of these communities. Where, where do others live? Um, Caledonia. Okay. Great, so some neighbors. Um, wherever you reside, we hope that you'll continue to stay involved and um, this is one of many opportunities we'll have to get together. So let's get started. So the common themes, as I mentioned, are the project and company overview, noise impacts, visual impact assessment, energy storage, public health and safety, and compatibility with agriculture. So I will ask Kevin Campbell to come up and answer some questions like, who is EDF? Why the decision to pursue a solar project here? Where is the power going? Um, what safety measures are in place or will be in place, the schedule and benefits that come along with the project. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to try to keep this to maybe five minutes or so, because uh, we do have, uh, like we probably mentioned, a lot of great panelists here who uh, only come here from time to time, and, and I'm a lot easier to get to this community. So if you have any other questions, and, and maybe you don't have a chance to speak to me today or tomorrow, uh, feel free to reach out. We have uh, an email address, 1-800 number, and if you don't have that before you leave, um, you know, please make sure you have that information. Uh, so if we go to the next 
the first slide here. So who's EDF? Um, so EDF Renewables, we've been in business here in North America for more than 35 years. Um, our company really believes in thorough engagement uh, with the community. So the very first public meeting we had here was in the middle of June, I think, 20, 2018. And uh, I believe this is maybe, sorry, maybe our fifth public meeting um, that we've had here today. And we've met with a lot of smaller groups, um, some neighbors, some larger groups. Uh, so we've been quite involved in the community, but if there's anybody who feels like um, you'd like to have, again, one-on-one -on -one meetings or anything, um, that's what we're here for, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, so we're also intending to be, so we have one of the largest operations and maintenance teams in North America, and we intend to be the operator and maintenance company on this project long-term, so building a good relationship and good rapport with the community is very important for us because we intend to be here for 40 years. Um, so the project location, I think the, the, the main piece of new information we're sharing here in this public meeting is what our permitting design will look like. So we want to submit our design to the Article 10 uh, process in the next couple months. Uh, so you've seen the boards as you've come in. Uh, all the properties, what you see in blue, are solar panels. Uh, what you see here in green is visual buffering or visual screening uh, of trees that we need to plant on the side of roads and adjacent to homes. Matt's going to talk more about that later. Um, what's going to be connecting these pods, we call them, all these different areas with solar panels, is uh, collector lines that are going to be buried four feet underground and connecting to our, our substation here, uh, centralized in the project. And that's going to connect to the existing 340, uh, sorry, 230 uh, kilovolt transmission lines that run through the project area. So at the end of the day, we're looking at a project that will uh, furnish enough electricity for 38,000 homes, or drive electric vehicles about one million mile, well, sorry, one billion miles on one year of production. So next slide. If there's any questions as I'm going along, feel free to ask. Um, one thing that's important is the town of Mount Morris has uh, enacted a solar code, so local law that we need to follow when designing a solar facility. And we are uh, designing in compliance with this facility. So the equipment has to be enclosed by a fence. Uh, we've, we have a vegetative buffer to provide year-round screening uh, along public right-of-ways and in the field of view from a residence on an adjoining property. Uh, the solar panels are set back 100 feet from the center line of the highway and 200 feet from principal residence structures. And again, those are minimum setbacks. Uh, the most important one, and this is something that, we, that has evolved in the last year, uh, but we're committing to providing a decommissioning security uh, to be held with the town of Mount Morris before we even start operating. So if anything happens and the site has to be decommissioned and for some reason we're not there, uh, the town has money held in the bank um, that they can draw upon to decommission the facility. And that amount of money will be uh, reviewed every five years to make sure that it's updated based on inflation and how the cost to decommission might evolve. And uh, we're also integrating grazers and pollinators, which is part of the code as well. And so in terms of operations and safety, just quickly, um, we'll have three full-time workers here locally uh, operating and maintaining the site. Uh, we also have an operation control center in San Diego that monitors the facility 365 days a year, um, to, you know, 24 hours a day. And uh, if anything were to happen with the site, um, those operators in San Diego would notify the local crew or the local emergency services personnel um, accordingly. So again, we, last night we met with first responders. Uh, we're keeping them very close to the project as well. And uh, we're committing to training them um, before the installation of the project. Uh, we've even heard that normally we do annual training uh, for these facilities, annual training updates. Uh, but we've heard from Livingston County that they do them twice a year, so that's something that we'll be doing here as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so equipment, removal, and restoration. So one thing that's unique with these solar facilities is uh, this is a reversible form of development. When you saw the map, uh, the first map that I showed, uh, everything that's not a road and not an inverter or transformer 
is going to be planted in vegetation. And typically, um, the site is about 96 to 90 percent vegetated. So that gives us a chance to have sheep or different things that we can use for, for agriculture um, under the panels. You know, we bailed hay at some sites, and again, Lexi will talk about some of these things. Um, so as part of decommissioning, all these facilities can be removed, the roads can come out, the equipment can come out, and uh, the site can be returned to agriculture or whatever the use is intended to be after 30 or 40 years. Uh, management of topsoil, very important. Uh, it has to be segregated, and then make, we have to make sure we don't lose any of that topsoil. That's one of the most important parts of construction and decommissioning as well. And in terms of schedule, uh, again, um, you know, initiated public consultation back in 2018. We had public meetings about a year ago. Um, submitted our, our second stage of our Article 10 permitting in uh, April 2019. Uh, currently having our third and fourth public open houses. And then I mentioned five because we had one unofficial one back in June of 2018. Uh, we intend to submit our Article 10 application maybe in the next couple months. Uh, we hope that application will be approved in about a year and uh, that we have our final approvals um, by the end of 2021 and can start construction by the spring of 2022, start operating uh, probably the fall of 2023 and then have the facility in operation for 30 to 40 years after that. So still a while before we start construction and construction may last a year to year and a half or so. And I think this is my last slide about local benefits. So this slide hasn't really changed in, in two or three years, um, but total project cost estimated to be about $200 million, created more than 200 jobs during construction. Uh, at the peak of construction, that could be much higher, maybe three or 400, depending on how, far, how fast we end up building the facility. Uh, again, three full-time operations jobs. And again, there could be some additional uh, work for contractors during that period of time. If we end up grazing the facility, uh, there's a lot of work involved in, in maintaining and managing the sheep. And over the first 20 years of the project, once we start operating, uh, we're looking at uh, contributing about $10 million in new revenues to the town. So for example, an acre of farmland right now might pay about $35 an acre in taxes. Um, with our pilot agreement and our host community agreement, we would end up paying about the equivalent of three, uh, sorry, four to five hundred dollars per acre in uh, contributions to the town, the county, and the school district. So, um, you know, some, providing some new money for the community, and hopefully, um, you know, that will go a long way too. And then on the right-hand side, you see a whole lot of direct and indirect benefits the project will bring. Um, everything from hopefully restaurants during construction will do very, very well in the community and people will be uh, you know, renting out rooms and things like that. And then all the other work um, with the trades and, and you know, sale of gravel and other things in the area. So yeah, we look forward to, uh, to seeing these benefits come into play. And next slide, I think that's it. I think that answered some of the common questions. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and again, if you would like another index card to submit questions, we'll hold until after all the speakers, um, and then I will be talking through those with, with the panelists. Um, next, we have Kenneth Kaliski for Noise Impacts. Um, we can go to the next slide. And I will be asking, uh, let's see here, can I have some common questions for you? If you can just tell us about noise, how you measure sound, um, impacts that can be anticipated from solar energy or from this project, and what you've studied so far. Thank you very much. So the outline of my presentation, I'm going to go through those, those subjects. Um, we'll do that. So sound is measured in decibels. And um, the average sound level, we, we did some monitoring in this community over summer and winter. And the average of all those sound levels is somewhere around 46 <laughs> decibels during the day. Typically, um, a design goal for a solar project is around 45, no, no more than 45 decibels during the day and less at night. Um, so the sources of sound that you find in a solar project, certainly the panels don't make any sound at all. 
Um, but scattered throughout the project, there are small inverters and medium voltage transformers. And then the essential point, there's the substation and perhaps energy storage that generates that generates sound. So we'll be looking at all of those sources in our noise study. So in terms of what those decibels mean and what the um, what everyday sources of sound levels are. I have a sound level meter in the other room on, on the far wall, so if you want to see what the, uh, the sound level is uh, of that, you know, the, the background murmur, you can go look at that. Generally, I was measuring in that other room you know, between you know, 60 and 70 decibels, the sort of background. Um, but you see that the decibel scale goes from zero, which is a threshold of hearing. That would be a, you wouldn't even, uh, see that on a daily basis, all the way up to, uh, say, 120, 140 decibels, which is uh, permanent damage. <laughs> but, you know, we live in this, uh, this mid-range here, uh, generally between 20 and, uh, and 110 decibels. 110 might be a chainsaw at your ear, and, uh, uh, you know, a shop back uh, might be at 85. Uh, TV might be about 60. My voice is probably around 60 decibels. Uh, the field with, with crickets might be about 50. And then you get to the much lower levels. Uh, uh, library with the, just the background. Uh, uh, HVAC, maybe about 38 decibels. And that's where most solar project sound is going to be in this, this very much uh, lower, lower region outside. So for Article 10, we look at the potential noise impacts of, of the project. So we do background sound measurements. As I mentioned, we've already done that here at seven locations in the summer, summer and the winter. We look at uh, noise standards and design goals to design the project too. And then we assess noise impacts with uh, computer noise modeling. So we look at the sources of sound, where they are, how much sound they generate, and then predict the sound levels at, at you know, all the property lines and the homes in the area. And uh, which in the next slide will show you those um, that, that uh, noise map. But just uh, uh, so this is an example of a of a noise map uh, where these little color contour lines are the different sound levels. Where this outer contour line is 30 decibels. You see the little houses and the orange uh, squares. Um, and these the sort of the bullseyes are where these sound sources are scattered around the project. So in terms of next steps, uh, we're going to finalize this mapping with the, uh, uh, adding some additional sources and put together the project noise impact assessment for the uh, Article 10 process. Thank you very much, Ken. Was that the last slide? Could you go to the next, anyone? Oh yeah, okay, so we're on to visual, thanks a lot. Um, so now we have Matthew Robinson from EDR, and he will speak with us about the visual impact assessment process, uh, the work that you've done so far. You can come on over here. Um, and, and most interestingly, show us what this project should look like. Thank you. So we're going to touch base on what we've done so far as part of the Article 10 process what our next steps are, and then kind of what a lot of people are here to see, what it's going to look like at this point in time. Um, you keep on going, you go to the next one. Um, we start off the Article 10 process by doing a viewshed analysis. This gives us an idea as to where the potential impacts may be, and it allows us to focus our energy where those impacts are, um, which is going to be the, the most helpful in a visual impact assessment. Um, then our job really is to try to get to know the community a little bit and the area of where this project's going to be. We do that through identifying visually sensitive resources, um, identifying landscape similarity zones, which are based on different characteristics that are currently existing in the, uh, the project area, and through multiple field visits as well. Um, we drive the roads during different seasons <coughs> and make sure that we uh, understand all of the different um, visual characteristics that are happening in this area. Um, we also go through a visual outreach process with the community and visual stakeholders, uh, as well as Chamber of Commerce, um, tourist groups, the, the uh, county at large, and we ask them if there are any other sensitive sites that we've missed um, 
or that would be important for us to look at for the community. Uh, and then the, through that public outreach, we also understand where high-use um, areas may be, where residents are um, gathering together, or where there may be more residential houses. And we look at that as a visual <coughs> as well. Um, we then come up with some preliminary mitigation modules that you may have seen earlier um, through the video and the simulations we have. We can look at those again later. Um, and that's where we get to the last, where we provide representative visual simulations, which we have provided some now, and we will provide more as well as we move along the process. Our next upcoming activities are, we have another round of outreach um, for the public that is being prepared right now, that we will look at um, the recommended viewpoints that will be produced in the simulations, and make sure that we are covering all of those sensitive resources and landscape similarity zones and different areas where residents may be viewing the project from. Um, and that leads into continual production of the visual simulations. Uh, we will then have those simulations rated as part of the VIA. Um, there will be two independent raters and one in-house rater. And from those ratings, we're able to provide the state um, with what the potential impact is from those preliminary simulations that we've provided. And that all goes into the results of the visual impact analysis. Um, we can move on now. Um, so, some of the more exciting stuff uh, and some of the more impactful uh, to residents and neighbors traveling here uh, are the visual screening. Um, these are some bullet points that we would highlight as ours. Uh, we would utilize the existing or native vegetative material, uh, replicate the existing landscape character, use the hedgerows that are existing, use the different clumps of vegetation that are currently around the site, and try to bring those into the project area. Um, our goal really is to soften the horizontal view of the panels and the fence line um, with combinations of deciduous and evergreen vegetation that has various sizes um, that really softens that edge and makes it wedge into the existing landscape. Um, we try to maximize the potential for views into the valley. We know that the, the valley here and the ridgeline, the opposite ridgeline, are an important view for many people. Um, so we're trying to put in vegetation that may remain below that view into the background and not grow to an extreme height um, in certain areas. Um, and this is all through the incorporation of native planting materials, which decreases the potential for environmental impacts um, and increases the potential for blending the project um, edge and for habitat as well. We come up with lots of materials that can be used. Um, this is just an example of some of them uh, that will be incorporated into our plans, all native material. <laughs> and then we've come up with different locations for these modules um, that go around the site depending on what the adjacent resource or adjacent condition is. Um, so we have three different modules that I'll get into quickly. There's more of this map can be seen over at uh, the, the visual station and we can zoom in kind of and look at different places if anyone would like to. Um, module one is a roadside softening. It's really uh, designed to go where there's an adjacent agricultural field. There's no real existing hedgerows or vegetative screening at this point in time. Um, the treatment, it creates a buffer to soften the views of the panels within the landscape and add additional pollinator habitat, which is important um, to make sure that we're keeping these environmental uh, additions as well. Um, the design considerations are Usually this is viewed from a moving car at speeds of 35 miles an hour plus. Um, there's limited road use by pedestrians and recreationalists. There's no adjacent resource or residence. And then we have a mix of deciduous and evergreen material uh, on a smaller scale uh, that will blend in as again and create that edge softening. This is a quick example of one of the modules of uh, one. This is the existing condition. This is the simulation in year one with the install size material. And then simulation in seven to 10 years. Um, you can notice this module one does have that lower vegetation that remains fairly low. There's blocks and groups of opening um, and then clumps of vegetation allowing for views through and not creating a real like wall that maybe you see of evergreen sometime. Module two is very similar. Um, it's used kind of in open fields, we 
with larger setbacks. Um, and it's used also to fill in the gaps of hedgerows that may be existing already or adjacent to the, um, the site that the project is going into. Uh, these considerations are strengthens the existing hedgerows at adjacent resources and provides a vertical element to soften the horizontal lines again of the fencing and the panels. This is another example. And these examples are all out there as well, so we can, you can study them a lot longer if you need to. Uh, this is year one. And then seven to ten years. Uh, module three provides the most amount of screening and is used for where there's an adjacent resource or residents that may be um, seeing the project from a stationary position where they are living or um, where they uh, recreated their home property. So this treatment really creates more of a buffer. Um, it uses larger material, thicker. Um, of material, larger evergreens, and more of the material to provide that larger screening ability. And then this is an example of that third module. You can already tell that there's a lot more um, mitigation and vegetation in the year one. It's also installed at a larger size to provide a little more upfront um, mitigation. And then you can see the seven to 10 years. Really pretty much is screening the majority of the project. And that's that. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, moving on to family storage. I'll ask Victoria and Carrie to join us. And um, Victoria will answer such questions as what is battery storage? Why are these systems used with solar? How safe is the system? What are the risks? And how can you minimize the risks? Hello, good evening. Um, so, as, as Dupali noted, I'm Victoria Carey, I work with DNBGL um, as an energy storage consultant. Um, so at a high level, just to understand what uh, is being proposed, um, the, uh, essentially uh, looking at having a building right now uh, full of energy storage, um, it would be 83 megawatts and a four hour duration. Um, energy storage is something that I think everyone in this room is pretty much already familiar with. Um, your cell phones have the same type of batteries that you'd be looking at in these type of systems, your smoke alarms in your kitchen, uh, your power tools. All of these utilize lithium ion batteries, uh, rechargeable lithium ion batteries. Um, and it's, it's a very similar technology. So you can look at that as it's, it's not something new, it's just uh, a larger amount of it so it can store a lot more energy. You wouldn't want it, uh, like your cell phone, you know, dying after 30 minutes. Um, you want to be able to use it for a long time when the sun isn't shining. And so that's the purpose of energy storage, is to gather that energy from the uh, solar PV when it's generated at noon, um, and be able to use it at 8 p.m. when everyone's uh, turning on their televisions, and maybe it's a hot summer day, and you're, you know, you're flipping on your AC before you go to sleep. So that's the purpose of energy storage. Um, right now, as I said, it's being proposed in a, a building-like structure. Um, the, the total space that the energy storage system would take up is being approximated about two acres of the thousand acres of uh, the total uh, uh, solar project. Um, it may be, however, in containerized systems. So the containerized systems would look a lot like, um, like the back of a truck. Um, and I'll, I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. And again, like I said, you know, these are, these are not being used for the first time. There are you know, about 600 of systems of this ilk um, installed throughout the US supporting solar projects just like this. So here's an example, battery energy storage system. So as you can see here, you know, these look quite familiar. You probably have a bunch of them rolling around in a drawer somewhere. Um, they, you would take thousands of these um, time up together um, in series and in parallel, and you would stack them into modules. Modules look like uh, several shoe boxes put together, maybe three feet across, um, and then those modules would get slotted into racks. So the racks would be a little bit taller than me, kind of like a, a server rack. Um, and then those would go into the container. What we're showing here is a 53-foot container. So just like you would see um, on the back of a 16-wheeler, um, the containers can be anything from 20 feet up to 53 feet. Um, and in the buildings, those same racks that you see here in orange and black, 
Those would just be in the open air inside of the building if, uh, if you went with the building solution instead. Within this system, there is safety and, um, safety and protection built in at every level. So there's tests that are done on the cell level. Literally, these tests, they essentially take a hammer to them, they, they uh, you know, take a nail gun and punch a hole through them and make sure that they react safely, um, even under these really uh, bad abuse conditions. Then you have a test that is on that rack level, um, the, the system that's about the size of me, to make sure that if, if anything goes wrong there electrically, that it doesn't hurt the rack next to it. Then you have a test that covers the entire container, um, making sure that um, if you have a, a big windstorm, if you have a lightning strike, if you have a hurricane, that you're not going to be impacting the equipment that's inside there, and that that equipment's going to keep you safe as well. In order to make sure that it's operating safely at all times, uh, there are constant monitoring that's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. There's constant monitoring that's going on. So uh, there's signals at pretty much those, those modules that I was saying that are about three feet big. There's tons of sensors in each one of those. And there's thousands and thousands of those in a system. And all of that data is going to be taken in through, uh, through those different monitoring points and fed back to somebody who's looking at that information 24-7. The system can react automatically if it detects something that doesn't look good. It can shut down and safely sort of just go to sleep until somebody can come out and make sure that it's operating safely. Um, and alternatively, you know, we, they can track and make sure that it's acting uh, appropriately all the way from California, where um, one of the, the monitoring facilities is. So we always know what's going on in here. You also have these HVACs on the top, the air conditioning units, um, and those make sure that the batteries are in a nice, safe temperature range. But I know that uh, you know, if I forget my cell phone in my car on a hot summer day, I might get a little warning that pops up and says, my cell phone shut down because it got too hot. There's, there's a, a nice air conditioner there to make sure that that doesn't happen to those systems, and that you always know that it's in that good range. And then finally, um, in case of emergency, there's also uh, fire protection and detection systems. So uh, there's suppression systems, there's smoke detection, uh, there's thermal detection, to make sure that you know exactly what's going on and that you can react appropriately to it. So if you go to the last slide, I just want to leave you with you know, why we use energy storage anyway. And we use energy storage because most of the sun is generated in the middle of the day, but most of the usage is when people are waking up in the morning, they're turning on their coffee pots, then they drive into their offices, and maybe Rochester is having a spike in the middle of the day, but a lot of the homes are empty, and there's just not a lot of electricity being used. And then at the end of the day, everybody comes home, they turn on their ACs, they turn on their TVs, they plug in their cell phones, and that's when you see the spike later on in the day. So if you click just one more slide, the whole purpose of energy storage is to say, we're generating all this energy during the day when nobody needs it, Let's level it out so that we have a consistent amount of energy or power that's available throughout the day when we need it. Alternatively, right here I'm showing, you know, you can have just this, just like a power plant, you can consistently create this amount and generate this amount of power out to the grid. But you could also have, if, if it's a really hot summer day and you have a spike where people need to make sure that their ACs are on so that they're comfortable and safe in a hospital or a nursing home, you can take that energy storage and you can supplement the solar energy, so you can produce more. So there's a lots of different ways that energy storage can be used um, in order to benefit the community. So that's all I have. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, please submit your questions, raise your hands, we'll pick up the index cards. Um, next we have Dr. Christopher Olson. And so we've heard that um, energy storage is relatively safe, but in the event of a battery fire, for example, should we be worried about pollution? And what about solar panel contamination? That is a question that has come up on other projects. So if you can speak to that, that would be great. Thanks, Polly. And I'd actually go a little bit further. It's not just relatively safe. It's energy storage facilities, and if you go over the next slide there, please, Jerry, are actually very safe. These are very, very, very unlikely event that a building like this is going to catch fire. You're gonna have a catastrophic failure where these things happen. As, and as Kevin mentioned, we actually met with the EMS, the fire department last night. It's actually the second time that I've been here in Mount Forest meeting with them. And so this, what we're gonna go through here is a little bit of a, if something does happen, 
worst case scenario, what, what you need or not you need to be concerned about. So as I think it's already been mentioned, it's, technology's been in place for years. New York has got the, the most stringent safety codes for these types of facilities. It's really becoming common throughout the U.S. that with these renewable projects, whether it's wind or solar or hydroelectric, that we're able to tie in these battery storage facilities. And they're often co-located right in residential neighborhoods. So there's a big facility that's going to into Queens in New York City. There's facilities like this all over the U.S. and often like right in the residential neighborhoods. To give you a level of comfort there, go to the next slide, please. However, this is a one of the containers that uh, Victoria was talking about. That, you know where they purposely caught this container on fire. There's a lot of testing that's done, and they've got you know her company and others have actually gone and they try to purposely let these things run away, catch fire, and then we see what happens. What we see is that yes, there'll be a smoke room, okay, like any other fire, if, but it's more like an office fire. Like it, the material that's in there, there's nothing that you know you have to be overly concerned about the smoke. The, the smoke itself coming off of um, one of these facilities would be very similar that you would have in an office building in a fire like that. We're working with the fire department and working through you know what's going to happen. And in fact, in this case, you're not going to be going to, you're not having to rescue anybody in the building. There's not going to be anybody in the building. They're going to know what the, what's there in the training. And like any other fire, if there was a fire, you know, your neighbor's house has a fire and smoke's coming towards your house, you're not going to necessarily stay in your house and want, you know, having that smoke coming in your house. So they will be the fire department there to set up a perimeter to work with the local residents to make sure that everything's safe. The other thing with the smoke plume is that there's nothing toxic in the smoke plume that's going to then fall out onto the ground and impact the neighboring fields, get worried about food supply or plants and the like. And all this has to be well documented in the Article 10 process when they file. The other thing that comes up from time to time is, well, what are these solar panels made up? Aren't we have a lot of toxic material in them and aren't they leaching then into the soil and the groundwater? In fact, that's not the case. The, the solar panels, and I think there's a panel in the other room that you, that you guys have brought. What you see is that, you know, yes, they do, but the solar panels contain trace amounts like any other piece of equipment, but all of that's contained within the panel. Even if the panel breaks, it's not, there's nothing there's no liquid within these panels that are leaching out. So these panels, even after the 30 or 40 years, as they're replaced and as they're, you know, the, the field itself that they're, that they're built on, it, the soil is not going to be impacted. The groundwater certainly won't be impacted. Solar panels don't catch on fire, but in the very unlikely event, you know, let's say you have grass fire underneath the panels, there's nothing that's going to come off of those panels and get into the air that's going to pose an undue health risk to the community. So the message we want to leave you with is that in the extremely unlikely event that either you know, you've got a grass fire within the, the solar facility itself, or you've got a fire within the facility that we're talking about for any juice storage, it is not going to pose any greater risk than, let's say, a barn fire, unfortunately, when those happen, or you know, house fire or, or an office building. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Okay, next up is and then for our last presenter, we have Lexi. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, Lexi, if you can tell us about agriculture and um, is solar compatible with agriculture, and if you can share your experiences and some of the benefits of solar to the agricultural community. Thank you, Brian. So, yes, I have. I've been asked by EDF to help exactly with this, which is a really neat thing. And that is that agriculture and solar um, come together with the idea of agrivoltaic or co-location or, and agrivoltaic is simply the idea that agriculture <coughs> is in fact compatible with solar. And I'm gonna explore some of how in the few minutes I'm, I'm gonna allow here. Um, so what we're talking about is this is an, an opportunity for farmers in your region and that EDF has a tremendously good track record here with integrating with the local agricultural community and economy. So what it is is it's an efficient use of land and the primary uh, vehicle for making this efficiency happen is with using great grazing sheep and the grazing sheep are put there quite purposefully and managed quite intentionally uh, to 
keep the sun on the panels and also to keep the vegetation where it should be, which is providing food for those uh, pasture-raised animals. And the other thing is it creates a much more complete ecosystem. And we talked there's a lot to this, but basically it creates a much more complete ecosystem around the solar facility. Um, I would say CEF has successfully partnered in the past with both the farmers and also the acreists. So for beekeepers. So first off, um, bees do like solar, and we all probably know in this room that there's, in terms of honeybees, there's not that we should all be like lending a helping hand. Um, the Mount Morris project is going to be designed in a way to um, allow for um, hopefully several local beekeepers to participate and have a place on the site. In addition, we're talking about seed mixes for the plants that will have a provide continuous bloom time so that those beekeepers can make honey production just like they do at the on fire site. Hopefully you all saw those honey jars. So one example of a solar site that is an EDF site that I visited is it's a pretty neat site in Ontario where there are many pastures at this farm and one of the pastures is a 150 acre fenced solar array where of course there's already some fencing because that's part of solar and there's shade from those solar panels so great protection for the animals from the weather. At this site in Ontario, the farmer owner produces 20,000 lambs a year. Some of them are produced on solar pastures. So the sheep just rotate through and they do the vegetation management and they're paid to do that. And the uh, farmers then um, have a product to sell, which is the grass fed free range lamb, which is pretty neat. Uh, next slide. Another EDF site that I've also visited, which is really neat, because now it'll be, I think, the, it'll be the fifth year, I think, that it'll be grazed. And what this has done is allowed a local, a local producer whose farm is six miles from the solar site to come to this 200-acre solar site with his flock in the spring, and then in the fall they go home to the home farm. And the example is here. This farmer has really been able to scale up his business. They sell entirely to, through local local venues, through direct sale to farmers markets, but also to regional restaurants. And they've been able to, um, they're starting, I think it's like triple their business, which is really neat. Um, and in terms of questions, you know, solar, solar grazing, which is what this is, greatly reduces or eliminates mechanical mowing. Um, is harmonious in terms of the sheep can go right under the panels. And um, of course, the participating landowner gets that advantage of the solar lease. OK. Here at Mount Morris, we're hoping um, to the solar site and you know, EDF is doing this, doing a, we're doing a grazing plan. We're working with EDF on that. Um, but it should be around 3,500-ish, 3, and we're talking adult sheep. Um, would be about the right number. So one thing that's really neat is that you don't, know, like with a typical grass-fed lamb operation, you know, there's no reduction in agricultural productivity at the site. You have the same number of sheep grazing with or without the solar, and what you have is the advantage of the economics of the solar and to the farmer, and you have the advantage of the shelter and protection, so it's well-being for your animals. Um, I do this myself, in case anyone's wondering. I have a grazing business in Central New York. Um, and so we will be working on not just the grazing plant, but a seed mix to support the, gra the grazing and the bees, so that honey production. There will be sheep moving across the solar site, and when the sheep aren't, those, uh, the vegetation will be allowed to recover and then produce the, those blooms that are essential to the honeybees, as well as other, other pollinator species. Thank you.